Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu for all of those who are uh, watching live, watching this in the future here in the space. Uh, it's good to be back again for another session of the Prophet Sallallahu and I. Today's session, inshallah, we'll be talking about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu in the aftermath of uh, Uhud, uh, in the aftermath of the trench, sorry, uh, because last time we had talked about a number of different things. We had talked about uh, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, coming after the Battle of Uhud. We had talked about these continued skirmishes and different raids. We had talked about uh, the dealings the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had with uh, different tribes and different hostiles. And we talked about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, in Medina, in just in, in his uh, regular life, what, what was going on in the in-betweens. Uh, and lastly, we had talked about the Battle of the Trench. And where we left out, uh, left off on was just wrapping up this battle, uh, which wasn't necessarily a, a well-defined battle. It was quite a bit of a uh, back and forth skirmish that would happen due to the fact that, uh, if you recall, the Muslims had dug a trench, which had made hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat quite difficult. So largely this battle was through arrow fire, through uh, people trying to cross over and getting into a skirmish there. So it wasn't anything intensive like the previous battles that were experienced. But from what we know, this was about a month-long siege. This was something that uh, the Arabs were not used to. As we had mentioned, the trench was actually the idea of an immigrant, of a Persian by the name of Salman Farsi. And again, like I said from previous sessions, we're not going to dive too detailed into the battles because I don't want, I can't, I don't want to do it uh, an injustice in that sense. There's a number of different great biographies and resources uh, which we have cited in the syllabus to give you the exact details of these battles. So to not leave anything out, I definitely want to make room for those and to have those referenced. But here we want to get the substance of what had happened, what were some of the things to be lifted up. If you all recall, the trench itself was a community effort. We had talked about how the trench was a community project. It wasn't just that the prophet had told uh, the men of the community, hey, go dig a trench, the women stay home. He didn't uh, demarcate any of these things. The trench was something that was collectively dug by men, women, children. It was one that was done as a community effort with men and women and uh, children all together in different facets and different capacities. And it included things like the singing of songs, the, the telling of jokes, the interaction, the sharing of food, breaking bread. So you can see that there was a, a type of companionship that was being fostered in this, in this event that, that was in preparation for something that was quite scary, that was quite, um, you know, quite harmful in, at the end of it, uh, but had the potential for quite a bit of a threat. Yet in the face of that, you see quite a uh, joyous, yet a uh, very profound event, community event going on with the Muslims at this time. So we talked about uh, how the battle itself was going, or at least the skirmishes were going, uh, and with regards to how eventually, uh, with regards to the Confederates or the Ahzab or the tribes and the uh, the, the confederacy that was against the Muslims, how eventually their confederacy itself began to fragment because of the fact that they could not penetrate Medina. We had talked about how uh, just from a geographical standpoint, Medina is surrounded by um, molten lava rocks and has mountains surrounding it and has a few areas that are open for passing. And those were the areas that were dug into. Those were the areas that were trenched. And so getting into Medina was, was a bit tough. And so they had to camp outside. And being the, the desert of Arabia, it is not exactly a hospitable environment, especially because of the fact that the siege had gone on for over a, uh, almost a month, I believe over 25 days. And so food supplies start to run out, morale starts to go down. And as always in the desert, the climate is unpredictable. Sometimes it gets really cold. Sometimes sandstorms come. So many things happen. But eventually, to get to the point, the uh, Quraysh, you know, having uh, been, you know, devastated by not just uh, by by about a month's worth of just having to wait, having not been able to uh, gain breach into the city, were eventually, uh, you know, demoralized. Their allies had started to leave, and within the context of 
the politics itself. We had talked about how uh, discord was sown within the two the camps uh, within the Confederacy by permission of the Prophet that uh, you know the the battle in and of itself was largely won without the drawing of a sword or without uh, you know counting people uh, a body count per se. It was won through uh, deceptive tactics. And this was where the Prophet ﷺ had given his famous saying that, you know, war is deception in this case, that uh, this, was, this was something that was permitted. And so uh, at the end of this though, at the end of once the Confederates had departed, once uh, the uh, siege had been uh, let up, once all of that had, had been let up, then we see the next step of this saga, of this event uh, takes its turn. And so this is actually one of the more uh, famous, but also one of the most controversial events in the biography of the Prophet And it's actually very interesting because of the fact that we view it from a very different lens. And so when we look at it for its face value, it does sound quite difficult to stomach. It's something that's very difficult. And this is the uh, expulsion, but more so the execution of the Banu Qurayda, which was the last major remaining uh, Jewish tribe that was in Medina at the time. If you recall, Banu Qurayda from our last session was a tribe that had stayed within the, uh, was within Medina. They were within the precincts of Medina. They were a tribe that at the time was, uh, were, had a treaty with the Prophet Sallallahu with the Muslims to not engage in hostilities and to, to, uh, to defend Medina against the uh, against the Confederates. They had even in some reports provided equipment to help dig the trench. So uh, there was some allyship that existed there, but because of their previous allegiances, they were coerced and they were kind of persuaded into joining the Confederacy. One of their other fellow tribes was amongst the Confederacy. So from what we had known, they were swayed, but they were very hesitant. They were not uh, they were not really uh, looking forward to like, yeah, this is now our time to strike against the prophet. They were very much hesitant to engage in this because they knew how much of a gamble it was. And when we see the end result of it, we see that this was not something that occurred again within the life of the Prophet in terms of how the Banu Qurayza were dealt with. This was something that was very novel. And so <clears throat> we see that it was definitely, there's some significance to it. And they even by their behavior, had indicated that by a lot of hesitation to not want to engage in hostilities with the Prophet ﷺ, especially after being on a treaty, uh, but choosing to do so. So uh, not to put that aside. I mean, a lot of times people will look at this and say, oh, they just betrayed the treaty and they went into it. No, you can see in the uh, biographies and the descriptions of these events that they were not wanting to engage in it. It took a lot of convincing for them. And so you can see that there, there is an element of that, that they, they definitely were doing some kind of state craft. They were definitely um, balancing their scales in terms of like weighing what their odds are and for, for what, what is the best chance for them to survive. And in their, mo in their uh, mode of survival, this is kind of what they had thought uh, would be the best option, would be uh, the zero-sum game to relieve themselves of the, the Muslim uh, threat that was uh, the, the, the occupation per se that was there. So as I mentioned, the seriousness of the punishment, which in and of itself was the fact that the, uh, the uh, to, to just take a few steps back, the Prophet ﷺ had, uh, once the battle in and of itself, you call it a battle, once the Confederates had left, the Prophet ﷺ became aware and was aware beforehand of the fact that the Banu Qurayza were complicit in uh, essentially treachery, in essentially in treason, that they had supplied weapons to the Confederacy, that they were in their fort, but they were on the side of the Confederates who were outside of Medina. And so learning about this, the Prophet ﷺ had given the order to besiege because had they been successful, the Banu Qurayza were the, uh, the end. If they were to allow the uh, Confederates to come through their side of Medina, uh, the city would have been routed, and we we don't know what would have possibly happened, but uh, the rules of war would have been quite different. And we, we see that in the Battle of Uhud, what had happened to some of the Muslims, to many of the Muslims who had fought against the uh, the Quraysh. We see that it wasn't just the fact that they had fought against the Quraysh, but we talked about how these battles are not just between strangers. These are people who used to be neighbors. These are people who knew each other. And whoever in these battles falls, if they die, they are often connected by more than one degree to someone on the battlefield as well as someone back home. 
and we saw how the thirst for vengeance, how that uh, multiple loss that many people had faced because of the Battle of Badr had brought out the sense of revenge at the Battle of Uhud that led to many people from Mecca to mutilate the bodies of the Muslims that had killed their relatives, that had uh, been uh, killing their uh, friends, their families. And so we see this, this, this type of uh, eye for an eye that was going back, but we see it to an, an extended uh, degree, especially with a society that doesn't have a specific law with regards to uh, mutilation or a specific ethic when it concerns that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi himself, we mentioned, was someone when he saw the state of Muslims who had been mutilated, he vowed to mutilate 30 Meccans himself if he had the opportunity. And he was quickly corrected by the Quran. He was quickly corrected uh, by the divine in that this is not the proper conduct for war. Even if they do you so wrong, you are not to mutilate someone. And so we see that these feelings, when they're give, when they are being expressed by a, a people that don't have a prophet, that don't have a system of ethics like that, what would, ha what would happen? And so now you think about uh, the potential of what could have happened if the Banu Qurayza and if the Confederacy were successful, what would have happened to the Muslims, but also to the most vulnerable, the people who had emigrated, the people who had ditched and uh, left Medina or uh, left Mecca and immigrated, the people who were the women and children, the servants, the slaves, the freed slaves, the people who had left captivity, all these different things. We think about the different possibilities, but we see that uh, in this saga that goes on. So the Prophet ﷺ instructs for the Banu Qurayza's fort. We talked about how uh, the tribes at the time had these fortifications. So he instructs the Banu Qurayza fort to be laid uh, siege to. It's another about month long standoff. There's a 25 day standoff, at which point the Banu Qurayza finally reach out to a, an old liaison by the name of Abu Lubaba. And they reach out to, to this liaison that possibly we can get his advice. Maybe we can uh, you know, make some arrangement like the previous two tribes, like the Banu Qaynuqa, like the Banu Nadir had made in which they were exiled from their home and they just had to abandon where they were. But uh, maybe we can come up with an arrangement. And so he himself, uh, you know, being a Muslim, had advised them to surrender, but he also gave them an indication of what their fate would be before for this for this treason. And because he had given that indication, because he had kind of already, uh, in a sense, given the plan of what the Muslims would be, uh, they they had come to know of what what this was going to be. What and this was this was not to be something that was already decided. This was not to be something that uh, was supposed to be known at the time. And so uh, this was seen as well in that sense as a as as a form of treason, though not a heavy treason, but a form of treason that that took place. He was still a Muslim. He had just made a mistake that hey he had had ties to these to these tribes and he had just wanted to warn them of what is going to await them. But he realized the mistake in what he had made in, in doing such a thing and he was guilt stricken and so he had left the the fortress and he had uh gone to the mosque of the prophet and he said i've made a tremendous mistake and i'm just going and he's like i want nothing more to do with this he ties himself to a pillar and says uh, i'm not going to leave here until god forgives me and the prophet some comments that you know if he would have just came to me uh, i would have forgiven him but you know now he's left the matter to god but it shows the sincerity of faith we definitely don't want to discount that that you know for uh, a slip of the tongue is what you might have called this, a, a, um, a Freudian slip per se. You might want to just cause by, by accident, he may have just said this, or by his, uh, his, his personal tie to, these, to this tribe, he may have said this. But he was so committed to that extent that he, he, had, he had felt such a, a impact on his spirituality that he felt the need to isolate himself. He felt the need to reproach himself. But we see in this example, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, by just saying that, if he's coming to me, I would have I would have forgiven him. That's fine. And we're going to get to a few of these examples of how the Prophet ﷺ engaged with people, not like Abu Lubaba. Abu Lubaba was someone who uh, was of sincere faith. But of people who said that they're Muslim, who had said that we believe, but they truly didn't believe and were actually hostile to the to the Muslim's cause. But how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with these people so gently and in a manner that is a, a lesson to us in our time today. But in any case, the Prophet ﷺ said, all right, his matter is with God. Um, let's Let's continue with uh, the process of uh, dealing with the Banu Qurayza. And so, as I mentioned, the seriousness of the punishment matched the seriousness for the potential of what could have happened if the treachery had succeeded. Some of the Qurayza at that time convert. Some of them say, hey, 
you know, I don't want to die. I don't want to experience this. I'm going to accept Islam. And they knew that if they accepted Islam, they would be uh, given permission to live. They would not be killed. That, that, that was not something that occurred. And so if they converted, that was their key out. So you automatically think that <clears throat> if this is about life and death, most of these people would probably should logically convert. If it's just about survival, logically, you will just convert over. But what's very interesting is that the Quraiza, after deliberating, largely refused to convert. Only a couple of folks convert uh, and or, you know, pay tribute or they refuse to pay tribute or they refuse to do like a mass suicide. The uh, event of Masada uh, was was brought up as an example in, in Jewish history of uh, the, the, the rebels at Masada um, making a last stand. So all the these things were running through their minds, but the easiest way out would have, of course, just been saying the Shahada, saying that they believe in the Prophet even if they didn't believe in the Prophet, there was already a group amongst them uh, outside in Medina that professed that they believe in the Prophet, but they really didn't, um, and they were doing just fine. So it was very interesting. It's actually very noble to be able to see that they held fast to their faith. It might have been on wrong pretenses here, but they, they felt that it wasn't worth giving up their faith because they felt that they were standing on what they interpreted to be the truth. And so they ended up surrendering, knowing that what was going to be the issue. But we mentioned that at the time before the Prophet ﷺ had come, there were multiple tribes in Medina. There were tribes that were of the Aus, of the Khazraj, which were the Arab tribes, and then you have the Jewish tribes. One of these tribes, the Aus tribe, had a very strong tie to the uh, Banu Qurayza, and they had the strong tie. And so when it came time to the fact that the issue of the Banu Qurayza was about to be dealt with, the Aus had said, hey, these are our friends from way back when, like, you know, can, can we uh, ask, can we have some clemency for them? Can you just deal with them in the same way you dealt with the other tribes? And the Prophet ﷺ had suggested then, would you be happy if I left this matter that if I decided, well, I, would you be happy if I give this matter to your own leader, to your own chieftain? And they were like, okay, that's fine. That's fair to us. We'll, we'll make the decision then. And so he turns the matter over to their leader, Saad ibn Mu'ad who had been actually injured during this, during some of that arrow fire. An arrow had come and hit one of his arteries, I believe in his arm, uh, and had been a fatal wound. And so he was essentially on his deathbed, but he was still alive. He had uh, been brought to give the, the judgment and he had ordered a, a very, uh, what we might look in this time now as a very strict or very severe judgment. And he had said that the fighters, the, those who fight, the, the men of the uh, Banu Koreza who had, who had engaged in hostilities, that they be executed. And that the women, the children, and the property of the uh, the, the men who uh, had been executed be uh, spared, but then be distributed amongst the Muslims. And so oftentimes people, uh, modernist scholars will look back and say, this is a very harsh punishment. This isn't exact, this isn't um, something that's befitting a religion of peace. This isn't something that is befitting uh, the, uh, you know, Islam, or this is what Islam is about. This is, the, you know, they'll either say that this does not exist, and so this does not happen at all, or they will say that this is what demarcates Islam, and this is what demarcates what prophet and the Islamic message are about. But it's very interesting that if you look at Deuteronomy 20, this is exactly in accordance with biblical law and example and precedent. And so many uh, uh, within the Muslim community will argue that uh, Saad ibn Mu'ad had been familiar with this and had simply just passed on the judgment to uh, the, the Banu Qurayza, a Jewish tribe, which was of their own text, which was of their own uh, religious um, ordinance. And so uh, they were not necessarily people say that, well, they were executed for being Jews or the Prophet ﷺ had done this for being Jews. But we see that they were not just executed for being Jews. They, they, you know, they, there were many Jews that continued to live in Medina even after this. There were, there were relations that the Prophet ﷺ had with Jews even after this time. We'll see that he marries uh, a, a woman who's Jewish, a couple of women who are Jewish. Um, and he does, they are not, you know, forced to convert at that spot. You know, we see that that there's not a hostility or an ingrained anti-Semitism that often comes to, to mind here. But all you need to do is just look at a few years before, look a few years after, you see that the Prophet ﷺ didn't deal with anyone in this manner. And you even see the fact that the, uh, that the Banu Qurayza had, uh, had, had you know, been hesitant to engage in, in, in the activities that they had with the Confederacy, you could tell that this was a high risk gamble and that they had accepted essentially their fate. They, they, they had the option to convert to save their lives. They didn't do that. They had the option to just fight to the death 
they didn't do that. They, 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 it seems to be that they had come to terms with what was what was there. And, uh, you know, with regards to what would go on, they probably hoped for clemency. But in, in, in such a case as this, uh, the, the scripture, whether biblical or Quranic, seemed to be fairly clear on that. And so the, uh, we, we see later on as well that there's more political and economic reasons beyond the fact that uh, it's just, you know, oh, they're just Jewish. No, that's not the case at all. There's, there's uh, many other reasons beyond the fact that it's, it's, it was uh, for reasons of political treachery, but also economically. What, what is, what is the, uh, the reason that uh, this, this tribe would be removed? And so, as I mentioned before, the Quraiza in their faith were very steadfast. And one, one report notes how before the execution, they spent the night in prayer and reading the Torah. So they were very sincere in their faith. Uh, and you can tell that they, they were essentially preparing for this. They were preparing for this moment, but it was, it was one that they, were, uh, that they were ready to embrace. And so one thing I want to note is because uh, in, in, in many accounts, as well as in modernists looking back on this, people will say that uh, approximately 700 or 900 people were massacred. And in a sense of the men of the tribe were massacred. So they'll put this that the Prophet ﷺ and his men beheaded because that was the form of execution that they each beheaded about or a total of 700 to 900 men. And uh, I will, I, I've, I'll will i post the article in our WhatsApp chat and in the syllabus, uh, Adil Salahi, a scholar reports that the entire tribe, uh, adult males being executed, that number couldn't really be accurate. And it couldn't really be a number much higher than 25, given the fact that there are reports that these men were held in a house before and then brought out for execution. And so he was like, what kind of a house can hold 700 to 900 people, especially in Medina, where it was where, where these were just like, you know, mud brick houses. And so we, we, we see that there is a contention with regards to that. Later sources may exaggerate it, especially when we look at the time of the Prophet and the battles that are being fought, we see that the tendency to exaggerate numbers to make things look greater than they are, um, they aren't necessarily reflected because, hey, this is this is what we've done um, later on, but this is that, hey, we we were able to dispatch this many people. We, we as the Muslims were able to do this much, inflict this much damage. But when you look at it practically, uh, it's very interesting to see what uh, Salahi has to argue about this, that there's actually maybe not more than 25 or 50 men that were totally executed. And the order was only given to execute those who were hostile. Uh, it's, it's very hard to say that one person or one crime is, uh, is an onus upon the entire tribe that goes against the justice principle of Islam. And so there's so much more to read into that, uh, but we'll post more about that. But uh, oftentimes this, this story comes up as an issue of concern, especially within non-Muslim circles or circles that are critical of Islam. And it's really important to see the, uh, the, the, the reasoning behind it, but also the full picture. It does sound quite brutal if you say the Prophet Islam executed 700 Jews. That's very brutal and harsh way to say it. And if you look at how these things came about, you get the fuller picture, you see that it's a much more complex uh, event that occurred beyond the fact that the Prophet Islam just didn't like Jews. That, that's not the case at all. So we want to definitely lift that up. But we also want to think about the collective trauma that it that is faced. It's easy for me, it's easy for scholars, it's easy for people to say that X amount of people were executed or people had to kill other people. We see now in our time, we know about PTSD, we know about soldiers that have uh, killed or committed crimes uh, against humanity and having to deal with that, having to see what they had to do. And uh, think about the collective trauma that is occurring with in the community, not just within Medina for the Muslims, but also for those of the Jewish community who had survived, the women, the children, the other men who were spared. Uh, we know of a, a servant who, who, had, who had come to the Prophet ﷺ. her name was Rehana. She was a woman of the Nadir, um, and she was married to a man in the Banu Qurayza who was executed. She became a servant of the Prophet. There's a question on whether she embraced Islam or uh, was became a wife of the Prophet. Some say she did, some say she didn't, but there there uh, are some who say that she held on to her faith. But just thinking about that her husband had been executed, maybe other, other relatives of her had, um, what was, if she had not a, a Islam, what was kind of uh, 
it, holding her back from that and thinking about the uh, not just the fact that, you know, when we look at history, when we look at these events, we often look at it just from, oh, the Muslims versus these people. Other people in, uh, have faced trauma, have uh, faced loss at the hands of Muslims. And it's important for us not to dehumanize anybody. Um, we, we obviously want to see, uh, you know, what, what side maybe comes out right in a sense, but we don't want to do a, a dehumanization to say one side is completely great. The other side is just worthy of all this stuff. No, there's, it's actually much more complex. And when you look at how the Banu Quraiza had embraced their fate in a sense and had spent that night in, in, in prayer, had spent that night reading the Torah, uh, you could tell that this was not a, uh, a, a very, um, you know, wavering group. This was, there's something very special about these, uh, these people who had, who had, who had chosen to uh, accept death rather than to just simply assimilate. And so there's something to, to be said about that. Uh, before we go on in the aftermath of this, of the, of the trench as a whole, Saad ibn Mu'ad, uh, as we had mentioned uh, earlier, he had passed down the judgment, which the Prophet ﷺ had accepted for the uh, Banu Quraiza. He had passed away due to his wounds. His, his, his passing was such a shaking for the community that the Prophet ﷺ had remarked that when he had passed away, um, it, it, it was as if the throne of Allah, the 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 uh, the arsh of Allah had shaken because of the fact that either that it was just it was just you know just such a heavy passing of such a uh, uh, of such a uh, beautiful person or that it was shaking out of excitement. This is just a a relation that's there, but it gives you the gravity of this person who passed away. And we also see in the aftermath of this communal healing. We see what's going to come about after this is a reduction in the hostilities and an increase in the desire for peace. But just think about the type of healing that needs to be done. The Os had just lost their uh, closest, one of their closest tribal connections. There are so many women and children who are now uh, without their husbands uh, because they had been executed. And so how are they uh, being brought into the community? And we see the Prophet did, uh, did not advocate for people to take advantage of anyone. They, he had advocated for them to be uh, taken care of in a manner that was just like their own families. And so you see uh, the injunctions being given in the Quran and in the example of the Prophet to free people who or captives to uh, give people their rights to marry women who are widows to uh, to give to the orphan so these commands don't say when you look at them in the quran it doesn't say oh the muslim women who are widows or the muslim women who are or, or muslim children who are orphans uh, it, it gives a very blanket term in terms of taking care of the orphans taking care of those who are widowed and to marry them to provide for them and so you see the muslim community is now being challenged to provide for those who had just undergone such a loss. Oftentimes we just write off these people by saying that, oh, they were uh, prisoners of war or they were captives or they were property in this sense. And we, we really dehumanize them. But just think about what they what onus they put on the Muslim community now to have to take care of them. So keeping that in the back of our mind. Now, in the aftermath of the trench, we uh, talked a little bit about in a previous session about Abul As. Abul As was the husband of Zainab. Zainab is the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ who was uh, in Mecca. She's now in Medina. Uh, and Abul As was, was a part of a caravan that was going up and that caravan had been uh, raided. Uh, and he had then snuck into Medina and he was uh, found his wife and was like, I'm, you know, they had been separated. Then uh, ever since the Battle of Badr, we recall that uh, Abul Aus was captured at the Battle of Badr, um, and his wife Zainab had sent a uh, necklace of his her mother Khadija, who was the Prophet Sallam's wife, uh, had sent this necklace as a form of ransom. And seeing it, the Prophet Sallam became very emotionally overcome. He became pale uh, and he started to tear up because he remembered Khadija by that memento. And he freed Abul Aas. He just said, hey, just send back my daughter. Um, that's all I want. You, you, you take everything. Just, just send me back my daughter. And this time around, Abul Aas has been without his wife for so many years and now comes back uh, and, and, and goes into her house. What's very significant about this, Abul Aas is not a Muslim at this time. Uh, Zainab takes him in into her home uh, with her with her child, with her children, and goes to the mosque as soon as she can. And right at the beginning of the prayer, makes an announcement that uh, Abul Aas is here and he's under my protection. And the Muslims go into their prayer. They come out. The Prophet says, 
did y'all hear what I heard right before the prayer? Because that's news to me. Um, and they were like, yeah, we, we heard that too. And he says, okay, if she, you know, she offers the protection, we protect who she will protect. And so he, he, it, it speaks a lot. Again, we talked about this last time, the agency of women within the time of the Prophet So many times we'll have oversimplified narratives, which will say the Prophet or Muslims had oppressed women to a degree that they just confined them to their homes. Yet we talk about how the wives of the Prophet who were probably the most guarded would be at the forefront in the mosque and uh, demanding things, would be having these conversations, would be standing up and asking for uh, things to be given to them would be asking for uh, different questions and whatnot, but would be given that agency to speak. And this is very different in our time where so many mosques will put women behind a barrier and not give them the agency to speak or be seen. But think about this scene where Zainab stands up and gives her protection. She's not someone with much significance or much power or anything. She doesn't have her husband with her, uh, who's not a Muslim at the time. She doesn't have any of these things that would give her clout, apart from the fact that she is the daughter of the Prophet. She doesn't have have anything else, but she just makes this uh, statement and the Prophet Sallam honors that. He doesn't say, hey, woman, be quiet. Like, you know, you're not allowed to speak. He, he says that, you know, we, we honor that. We, we didn't, he didn't stop that. And so uh, he tells uh, Abu Al-As that, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's under protection. We're not going to harm him or anything, but uh, because he's not a Muslim, he's, he's still uh, of the religion of, uh, of, of Mecca that he, he needs to um, go back, that they can't stay together. Uh, and he actually, you know, goes back with, with his caravan, with, that, with whatever has been taken. He goes back, he delivers it, he comes back to Medina and becomes a Muslim and he lives with his wife there. So uh, we see that, you know, the Prophet didn't deal with someone harsh just because that they are a different religion or just because they are a different person. And because this person was a member of his house, even someone who was married to his daughter, he probably had more of an incentive to be harsh with this person that why haven't you converted yet? Like, you you know, we're, we're, I'm your father-in-law. I'm practically your father. Why haven't you? He didn't say any of that to him. He, he was very gentle with him. And we see how the Prophet Sallam deals with folks who are different than him, yet in a manner that incentivized Islam, that made it palpable. So when Abu al-As re returned to Med uh, Mecca, he didn't just think, probably just think about, oh, I'm going to become a Muslim for, for Zainab. But hey, I wasn't even like you know, uh, harassed or anything for my beliefs. And so it was even more uh, of a of an opportunity to come back and to be a part of something. We also see after the uh, battle of the trench, the Prophet had uh, uh, engaged in another marriage um, to Juwaliya. Juwaliya was a um, was was a member of the tribe of Banu Mustalik. Banu Mustalik was uh, a tribe that was on the western side of uh, of the Arabian Peninsula. So if you think of the Arabian Peninsula, the western side is more so by the Red Sea. And so uh, they had reneged on an agreement with Medina. They had they had a treaty with Medina, but they reneged on it. And so uh, the Prophet had taken his uh, his his, his um, you know his unit had had taken um, a uh, an army or so to to put an end to that, but uh, they hadn't engaged in uh, an, an overwhelming hostility. I believe the Bani Mustalik was simply subdued. They were not you know overwhelmed. There wasn't like a huge battle or anything like that. But this marriage to Juwaliya was a uh, was a tie to this tribe now because uh, many people within the tribe had been taken captive, had been uh, had been you know come under the control of the Muslims, but. Her marriage to the uh, Prophet had had led to the freedom of her clan, had led to the freedom of those people who had uh, subsequently started to become Muslim. And Aisha comments on Juwaliya that I know of no other woman who was of a greater blessing than her to her people. And you see that the Prophet didn't just marry people. We see this all the time in different commentaries that uh, he, he had an appetite for women or that he wanted to just marry as many women as he could. We see the Prophet marrying people for a variety of reasons, but not just for those reasons. He didn't just marry someone simply because it's a uh, it's a, a political reason or whatnot. The Prophet was a, was a man, was someone who felt affection, was someone who loved women, was someone who uh, was a human. And so he had these, these feelings that were there, but his marriages were not just to satisfy uh, sexual desires or, or something that were for carnal desires. The Prophet his marriages brought a benefit that was felt not just to him and to his wives, but to the entire community. And in Juwadiya's example, you see that you now have not just a alliance with a tribe that's on the Western side of Arabia that opens up a trade route, but you now have uh, a whole people that were previously 
captive because they had engaged in hostilities are now freed. And so you see that there are so many benefits that come apart from the fact that, oh, he just got married. We, we, when, when we reduce it to the fact that the Prophet married X amount of wives, we really de, um, uh, delegitimize how important it was for these, uh, these marriages to occur, especially in that uh, atmosphere. I posted a picture the other day uh, give, showing the climate of what, Medi uh, what the Arabian Peninsula looked like for the Muslims at the time. And they were basically on an island surrounded by hostiles. And the way you were to, in D D um, you know, um, the way you were to kind of de-escalate the situation, the way you were to really give uh, a, bit, a way for um, being able to survive was to engage in friendly uh, conversation, was to engage in friendly relationships with these tribes, was to make treaties and whatnot. And one of the ways of pre-Islam and of Islam was it through marriage. And so this was something that had come up. Now, transitioning beyond that, we see the Prophet some engage uh, and being dealt with another challenge, but a challenge from within. And this is a challenge from within that really pervades up until this day, because many of us may be feeling that we're guilty of such uh, level of this of this type of uh, vice, but this is something that has been pervasive within the Muslim community since the onset. And this is the uh, the aspect of hypocrisy. They are referred to as the hypocrites or the munafikun in the Quran. So we see that Abdullah ibn Ubay was known as the leader of the hypocrites, was someone from the onset of Muslims coming to Medina, was not happy about Muslims coming, had converted simply for political reasons, uh, but in his time had, would, would periodically make blasphemous comments and remarks. And one of these times he had made a quite a blasphemous uh, remark and comment uh, and as a very strong slight against Prophet ﷺ. A young man by the name of Zaid had overheard Ab 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 Abdullah ibn Obey saying this and had gone straight to the Prophet ﷺ and said, hey, Abdullah ibn Obey just said this, I heard it. Uh, Armor, who was the Prophet ﷺ, one of his closest confidants and allies had said that, hey, this is this is it. Like you know, this Ibn Obey guy has done a lot of like uh, you know uh, backbiting for us. He's done a lot of things that really undermine us. He, if you recall, during the Battle of Ohud, brought a contingent of about three hundred soldiers and said, "You know what? We said we wanted to fight in Medina. Uh, we're not going to go with you." And he withdrew. He he took his three hundred soldiers back. And the Prophet didn't reprimand him or do anything to him uh, at, at at that time. And so this just kind of reached another boiling point. So Omar had suggested they punish him. He said, "Hey, this guy has been of no benefit to us at this time. Let's just put an end to him." The Prophet then gently reminded. Omar. He said, Omar, what will people say that if I kill him and if he is to be removed, that Muhammad kills his followers, that Muhammad kills his companions. So he even considered this person uh, a companion of his. He, he used him in that same group. The Prophet ﷺ dismissed the matter uh, in terms of the accusation after Abdullah ibn Obey had come in front of him and had said, no, I didn't say that. He had lied to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, no, I didn't say that. And so the Prophet ﷺ just dismissed it, said, you know what, just go on your way. Uh, that's fine. Uh, and Zayd was really hurt. Zaid was really hurt because he was like, I, I feel like I wasn't believed. Like, you know, you, you just think about someone who has seen something happen and it, because maybe of his age or because of his standing, uh, he's not, his, his opinion was at that time not registered. But it's important, again, we talk about throughout the series, how the Quran at this time and to our day today is a text that engages you right at the heart, is a very personable text that meets the believer where they are. And divine revelation came shortly after, after in Surah Munafiqun, uh, the Surah of the Hypocrites, which confirmed what Zayd was saying. It told the Prophet ﷺ exactly what Zayd had seen and that this was the fact. The Prophet ﷺ had, uh, you know, had, had told Zayd of this and had, had given him uh, those glad tidings that, hey, you know, you, you, know, you, were, you had said this, um, you had uh, said it truthfully, and Allah has recognized that. And that, that in and of itself is a huge honor. But we see the Prophet ﷺ continuing to try and preserve the community. After this verse was revealed, uh, the son of Abdullah ibn Obey had, had heard that there are rumors that people, after hearing this verse, are wanting to kill my father. His son was very close to him, but his son was also a very strong Muslim. So imagine that in a sense that you are a son, your father is maybe the number one enemy of the Muslims, but he is a Muslim himself, so he makes it a catch-22 of wanting to, trying to take care of him. So he himself says, 
uh, to the Prophet Sallam that, hey, let me just, let me remove him. Let me execute him uh, because he, he's, he's my family member, but I'll, I'll take the heat for it because, uh, you know, th this has gotten to a point to that we, we, need to, we need to take care of him. And what's even more astonishing at this time is the Prophet Sallam still, after getting this offer from Abdullah Obey's own family member, own person, says no. And he says no and deal gently with him. Make, uh, we want to make the best of his companionship of the time that he has left. You, you don't get this from any, and this type of forgiveness, especially for someone who later on will continue to play a very malicious role in the life of the Prophet Sallam. He continues to offer that branch of extension of freedom, of extension of pardon, because of the fact that Abdullah ibn Abu has, has professed that he's a Muslim. He's professed that he's a Muslim. As bad as he can get, he is still professed that he's a Muslim. And if the Prophet ﷺ takes any action against this person, it is reflective on the fact that this is uh, this is how Prophet ﷺ had deals with his companions. And so he recognizes that, but also he recognizes that Abdullah ibn Ubay is a very influential person. Abdullah ibn Ubay has a whole contingent of people who are known as, uh, you know, it's not to them per se, but are known as the hypocrites. And so if he is to take out Abdullah and obey, what does that say about the potential for those other people who might feel that Islam is just about this? And so the Prophet knows that this is a tough pill to swallow, but he advises even those who are willing to just take the blame for it and to remove this person to be gentle with them, to be patient with them, uh, and their, that their companion should be made best of because their hearts could change. And so when we think about people in our lives who are absolutely the bane of our existence, who do everything to undermine them. We oftentimes cut them off. We oftentimes want to do something that will just remove them from the picture. But uh, we see in the example of Prophet Sallam that he really had a long string of patience for this person. And, and this person was directly a threat to him. And so we see that there is a way to deal with it in certain circumstances. But uh, in this case, where the Prophet Sallam had absolutely the right to deal with this person in a way that, uh, that no other person did, he still offered that clemency. So we go into another... The, just kind of escalating this uh, really quickly off of the uh, off of another story that is very uh, very difficult for the Prophet and the community as a whole, but especially for the wife of the Prophet for Aisha. So, 18 years after the revelation, we see this is 18 years after the revelation of uh, of uh, the Quran to the Prophet uh, Aisha. Who's the wife of the Prophet? She is on this campaign that's coming back from Banu Mustalik. So, when uh, the Prophet went to marry, had uh, his marriage with Juwaidiyah, he's coming back from this, uh, this expedition. She loses a necklace that uh, was given to her by her mother. Um, and so she loses it. Again, you know, you're traveling in the desert. You don't exactly have a metal detector. You don't exactly have street lights or lampposts or um, a tile that you can attach to it at this time. It is, it's something that looks quite, uh, quite, quite a bit, you know, uh, monotonous. And so the Prophet uh, has, you know, them set camp. She loses her necklace and the companions are tasked to go and try and find it. They, uh, you know, are, are eventually looking around, but they get, they themselves get frustrated. They get upset. They get thirsty. Um, they're in the desert. They're like, Hey, we were supposed to move on X amount of time ago. And right now we are just literally without water. We have to pray. We don't have any water to make evolution. And we see that while they are getting frustrated, while Abu Bakr, the uh, father of Aisha is getting frustrated. The Prophet ﷺ receives a revelation giving permission to be able to do the wudu, the purification without water. So what we call tayyumum. So the Prophet ﷺ is given permission to do this. And so uh, the, the companions actually rejoice at this. The companions say that, you know, Abu Bakr, your family has given us another blessing in this case. But later on, as they, they continue the caravan, she loses her necklace again. And so she loses her necklace again. She goes to answer the call of nature uh, and she loses her necklace uh, in doing so. And the caravan, because they are kind of kept in these things called hodaj, uh, the hodaj is literally, you probably see these um, in other countries, but uh, it, it, it's literally just like a carriage that is put on top of a camel. And because Aisha is still uh, not a very old person. She's fairly young. She's also not very heavy. She talks about how she's a very skinny um, uh, woman. And so the caravan leaves without her. They, they don't necessarily feel that someone's missing. And so she, while she's out answering the call of nature and, and out looking for her necklace, the caravan leaves. And so she kind of like freaks out. And so she's like, okay, I'm just going to stay where I am uh, because if they, if they come back, they'll know exactly where I am. 
And so she falls asleep there. A companion that is coming from this expedition as well behind the caravan sees and finds her. And so he had uh, been a companion before the time that the uh, that these you know uh, these carriages were installed. And so he had known what the Prophet's wife uh, and his wives had looked like. And so he is, his name was Safwan, and he had seen her, and he put her on his horse, and he had walked the entire way from that time all the way back to Medina. And it's quite a bit of a walk, but he had walked her back. And you can imagine the sight, the sight that this is to see for people who whose hearts waver, for people who are very eerie to gossip, for people who are very much wanting to uh, be in on the tea for the day. And so this was the tea that they see Aisha, a young girl uh, being walked in by a fairly fit younger man. And so their imaginations run wild and they, they assume a lot of different things that go on. And so the rumors that, uh, that start to go, the, the salacious rumors of the affair of Aisha and of Safwan start to spread like wildfire. The Aisha never hears of this. Aisha doesn't hear of this because on coming back, she uh, becomes sick. And so she spends some time at her, uh, at her uh, parents' home, but uh, her own family, her own cousin is one of the people spreading this rumor. The Prophet Sallallahu own cousin, Hamna, is one of the people spreading the rumor. The Prophet's poet is someone, Hassan ibn Thabit is someone who is spreading this rumor. And of course, uh, the, the chief of the hypocrites, Abdullah ibn Obey, is someone spreading this rumor. So people are spreading this rumor like wildfire. The Prophet Sallallahu is hearing of these things, but Aisha is not because she is literally um, just has been secluded for this time. Eventually, she comes to know of this rumor, and she is utterly heartbroken. She it's she describes in her own she describes this entire account in her own words and to in her own uh, narration, and describes how she was just overcome with tears. She was just like, how can someone think of this? How can someone even uh, con conjure up something like this? And literally just spends her time just crying her eyes out and just think about the pain of, uh, especially from a woman's lens, who being slandered, being slandered by uh, a society and uh, again, something that's not true, but it's assumed to be true by all these other people. And so just the pain that is going on through her mind, we want to really center Aisha as she's experiencing this. And as well, the Prophet ﷺ, who is really distressed at this. The Prophet ﷺ, after all, is human. You know, this, this, this event of all things really shows not just the resilience of Aisha and the resilience of um, her spirit in this time, but also her vulnerability. But it shows the truthfulness of this message because if the Prophet Sallallahu was just any prophet or just anyone, he could have just said, oh, you all are lying. God told me that she's fine. Um, you, she didn't do anything and you're all lying. But he himself was really hurt. He himself was like, I don't know what to believe. So he seeks the opinion of his household. He goes to his household and he asks uh, his his uh, his adopted grandson or his, his uh, the son of his formerly adopted son, Zay, uh, Usama, he asks him, what, what do you think? He asks his, uh, his mother, Ome Ayman, he asks uh, who he had called his mother after his mother. He asked, what do you all think about Aisha? Like, what, what is there? And they said, we only know good of her. Ali, uh, his cousin, on the other hand, was like, you know, why, why are you bothering yourself with this? If you'd like to marry someone else, you can go marry someone else. Um, and so he was, he and Aisha maybe didn't have the most best relationship that that was there and that will come out later on but um he was more calculated in his response and Aisha's servant though had uh, said the same thing that Osama and Ume Ayman has said that I know nothing but good of her and so the Prophet is convinced at this that look you know nobody had said anything bad especially of the people he trusted most he's like I believe them so he goes to the mosque the next day at the pulpit and he defends his wife he says that hey these rumors aren't true the people have spread a rumor against me and my family um you know that that's that's something that is absolutely outrageous and it's not true it's it's something that is very uh just just completely uh, atrocious in that sense and so uh, a fight in that sense breaks out between the people who are listening to this address because uh people on one side had accused another tribe and the other tribe had said that you know that that's not fair you don't know that that's true and so a fight had broken out in that sense uh but aisha at the whole time is unaware that her husband is out there saying that no my, my wife's name is clear but we could still see when the prophet Sassam comes to visit her he's still not sure it's, it's just like he needs some kind of confirmation even after this event so he goes to the home of abu Bakr, the father of aisha and he asks Aisha point blank. He said, hey, you know, if you're innocent, you know, just say it. If you're guilty, ask Allah for forgiveness. And she is speechless. Imagine being a woman, imagine being a wife and your husband telling you this, that, hey, just to confirm, 
you can do this, you could do that. And, and just imagine just how painful that must have been. And she, you know, makes her plea. She, she refers to some verses in the Quran, but she's um, tremendously hurt. And what, what comes out of this is there is at that time when the Prophet was with them, and she just goes in on him and she just says that how can you even believe this and turns away from him uh that revelation comes down at that moment uh in surah nur which clears her name which which uh kind of just disregards those people who had said who had spread a a, a this very um salacious law uh, and had said that you know this this is not true this is something that uh you know woe be unto those people who are spreading these kinds of rumors and so it took over a month for this revelation to come down from the time that uh, the rumors had started up until this moment of revelation. And Aisha has been in agony since then. We see that this event, as I had mentioned, is uh, first and foremost a, a testimony to seeing just on a evaluative level how the Prophet's message was truthful because the Prophet if he was certainly a leader, if he was certainly someone who was just prideful or someone who wanted to have a grip on his community and was certainly after power, you would see that he would just say, this is either not true or he would just uh, remove Aisha, Aisha from the picture. He would, he would make a calculated political move. But he said, no, uh, he didn't do that. And he suffered with that. His wife suffered with that. They all, his family suffered with that. Uh, the, the parents of Aisha suffered with that. Um, people, family members were kind of torn between what to believe. And so you can imagine that the Prophet knew that this decision was not his to make and that in and of itself being a sign of his truthfulness. But again, we see in Aisha that when uh, her mother sees this revelation come down and sees the Prophet say what he says, says, Aisha, you know, thank the Prophet for uh, for exonerating you and whatnot. She says, no, I'm not going to thank him. I'm going to thank his, his God. And so you see this resilience that's in Aisha, but uh, you see her uh, just having to go through this, but uh, just just imagine what what that that loneliness, that isolation must have felt like, especially at a time when even her husband, who's the prophet of God, um, was was really just like wanting to confirm the truth, but also being traumatized by this. And so, uh, in the aftermath of it, we mentioned that the cousin of the Prophet or sorry, the cousin of uh, Aisha, uh, his name was Mista. He was one of the people who spread the rumors, and her father Abu Bakr was someone who was giving charity to him. And he had threatened to withhold that charity. Now that he had heard what Mista was saying about his daughter, he had said, hey, I'm just going to uh, withhold my charity. You're, you're not going to get anything, Mista, for what you did. And the revelation comes down and says, don't withhold your charity from those uh, who, who, who you had been supporting. And so you see that the Prophet and, uh, and in the divine itself to still take care of the poor, to still take care of those in need, even if they slip that others who had spread this rumor, they had been forgiven as well. That uh, that there was not a, a, you know, if the Prophet was someone who was a uh, megalomaniac or someone who was just a narcissist or someone who was just, you know, uh, self-serving or just about pride would have uh, dealt with these people in quite a harsh manner. But each of these people were, were forgiven. They were given the punishment, but they were forgiven. And most importantly, he had told uh, the person who was most at disadvantage to at this whole situation, just practically speaking, Mista, to be uh, not just being given charity, but also to continue to be provided for. And Abu Bakr mentioned that not only did he give him, he gave him more than he could than he could do it because he knew that that's uh, what in Allah's eyes was still pleasing. It was not pleasant to it's it's not pleasant to spread a rumor, but it's also not pleasant to uh, withhold alms from those who are in need. But uh, it is it is it is uh, part of that part, part process of justice as well to to ask for forgiveness as well. And so uh, just as we kind of go through here, I, I want to be mindful of time, but uh, we're going to touch base real quick on Hudaybiyah. So this, this whole ordeal of Aisha is, is quite a traumatic event, but it is followed by uh, events that at least allow for the community to, to heal. So in the 19th year of the revelation, we have Hudaybiyah. The Prophet sees a dream. The Prophet sees a dream in which he is back at the sacred precinct of Mecca that he is uh, there in front of the Kaaba. He has the key to the Kaaba. He's basically making pilgrimage. And so he decides that this is a sign we need to go for the pilgrimage. And so he, he gets uh, a thousand pilgrims. He, he announces that we're going to go for a pilgrimage and we're going to go uh, to Mecca. And so we're not going to go armed. We're not, we're not going with our swords uh, out other than the ones that we need for on the travel. Um, 
because again, you're going through Arabia, it's not I-35. You have uh, things that are in the wilderness that could be of harm. Uh, there's other people as well that might be of harm. And so he takes 1,000 pilgrims, he takes uh, 70 sacrificial camels and animals, uh, but he doesn't go fully armed against the advice of some of his companions because he's like, hey, we're just going for pilgrimage. We're not going for anything else. Some people are thinking that, hey, he's going to be walking to his, his to his death. Like, you know, the Quraysh aren't going to deal with him, uh, you know, in a, in a soft manner. Uh, and so his his wife, Umm Salama, is also part of this expedition. So as they are going, uh, not expedition of this pilgrimage. And so uh, his wife, um, Umm Salama, joins Quraysh as uh, the Muslims are approaching, learn that they are coming, and they dispatch uh, Khalid ibn Walid, one of their generals, to go stop them. Uh, the Prophet redirects them uh, based off the advice of other companions. So we continue to see this recurring theme of the Prophet not just being the one person through whom everything goes through, but him using other people and giving them agency and seeking their opinion that even though he was a prophet of God, he left certain matters in the hands of other people or he was open to suggestions and conversation. And so he has the Muslims redirected. His camel comes to rest at a place that is now known as is known as Hudaybiyah. They pitch their camp, and so uh, the the Muslims are now settled there. But the Quraysh start to send delegations to see like what is going on, and they start to see that the, hey, you know, they start to get word back that these guys are just here for pilgrimage. And so the Quraysh are in a catch twenty two. They are the keepers of the sacred precinct of the house of God. So on one hand, they can't bar anybody from coming to see the house of God and to make their pilgrimage because that is their bread and butter. That is what they are about. On the other hand, if they are to allow the Muslims to come in, they give a sign of weakness. So you see that there is a really big catch 22 for them in what's going on, that they, they there's a lot at stake and they don't know what to kind of do. They're very hesitant with moving on, but they, they want to try and negotiate their way to something that can be agreeable. So they send a uh, they send one negotiator, two negotiators, three negotiators, all of whom say that these guys are just here for pilgrimage. They don't even have proper like weapons. Like they're 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 not even here to fight. They're just here to do their pilgrimage. And one of the people goes, um, whose name is Urwa, and he's a bit more uh, you know a bit more candid with the Prophet Sallam. He has very strong interaction with the Prophet Sallam. Uh, you know he's he's very hands on. There's a there's a custom in that time of being able to talk to someone but grabbing their beard and like just telling them. So like you know if you you see some people now our days uh, holding someone's shoulder and being like let me just tell you something. But in that time in their custom grabbing the beard was some uh, was a way of doing that. And the Muslims around him got very agitated and said hey like you know let go of his let go of his beard don't touch him or you're not going to get that hand back uh and he comes back to the Quraysh and he describes one that hey these guys are just here for pilgrimage but two their devotion to their prophet is like nothing I've ever seen before we talked about last time how people had observed that uh these people love their prophet more than they love their own father he observed that I've been a, a, a like a uh a minister to your to a foreign minister essentially I've, I've gone to other countries i've seen how people deal with their rulers this guy his people like love him more than those people and so the prophet as well on that on that note sends negotiators he sends negotiators and it's not working he sends uh uthman uh who has at least some tribal connection who has some protection who goes who's received well to negotiate on behalf the Muslims, but he is kept overnight. So, uh, you know, the, they, the Muslims start to think that this person has now been killed, that the, the, the Quraysh have killed him. So the uh, they, they offer Uthman, they say, hey, while you're here, why don't you just go make pilgrimage? You, you can you can go make it. Um, and he said, no, I'm not going to make it until the Prophet Sassam makes it. And what's very interesting is that because these people, the Quraysh were allies with Abdullah ibn Ubay, because they knew that he was someone who's kind of on the inside, they made him this offer too. And what's very surprising is he declined for the exact same reason. And when the Prophet Sassam came to know of this, the Prophet Sassam prayed for it. The Prophet Sassam didn't say like, all right, that hypocrite like did one good thing in his life. Like as we might've said that, oh, that person finally, they're finally praying or they're finally doing something. He prayed for him. He, he, he spoke good of that person, even though at that moment they were, they, they may have not been of the best character or of the best track record. He still did something that was, that was right. And the Prophet Sassam acknowledged that. And so while this whole ordeal is going on, the Prophet Sassam starts to see maybe morale is depleting. Maybe all these things are going on because you're outside of Mecca. It's not 
an oasis. It's a very barren land. Uh, and so he uh, drafts up a, a new pact. He, he calls people uh, under this acacia tree, uh, this Ridwan, and he says that let's, uh, we're going to make a pact of allegiance. And so uh, just so we know that we're all in this together, that this is going to be a tough time, but let's renew our pledge to why we are here. So he makes this pact, uh, and so everybody comes who is in the tribe or in the in the in the um, in the expedition and takes their pact with the Prophet Sallallahu And because Uthman is still in Mecca, still being held in Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu maybe at this time assumes that he's been killed or he's been being detained or whatever it may be. A lot of people thought he had been killed, so he raises his left hand and said he says that this is Uthman's hand, and he uh, takes his own pledge for him. And so uh, we see that uh, at this time, you know, Uthman eventually returns back. So there is, uh, there is some uh, tranquility that is restored in the minds of the Muslims and to the Prophet ﷺ. But the Quraysh, again, send a negotiator that says, hey, we want to finally settle this manner. They send their best negotiator by the name of Suhail, who goes back and forth with the Muslims in how their treaty is crafting. And what's very interesting is that, you know, the Prophet ﷺ says, uh, to Ali, who is writing out the treaty, he says, all right, as we do with all of our treaties and everything, write Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And Suhail is like, no, wait, we don't know who ar-Rahman is. We don't, this is not a, a, a familiar name or concept of God to us. Just write Bismik Allah. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and just write, you know, in your name, Allah. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, you know, write that. And the Muslims are, you know, furious. Like, why? this is always what we write our stuff with. Why are you giving in to him? But the Prophet ﷺ knows that that's still something acceptable, but for the sake of negotiation, let's go ahead and do that. So the Prophet ﷺ is teaching them a lesson in compromise. And what's most significant and what's most traumatizing at, their, at this time for them, uh, right before it gets to the treaty itself, is the Prophet ﷺ, uh, tells them, okay, uh, now write in this treaty between Muhammad, the messenger of God, and Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail says, wait a second, hold on, man. You, uh, if we knew that you were the prophet of God, if we recognize that, we wouldn't even be having this negotiation. We wouldn't even be having this issue. You wouldn't have to camp outside. You would be inside. So we would have zero issues. Remove prophet of God and put uh, your father's last name or put your father's name. And the Muslims are furious at this. Uh, but the Prophet has ordered uh, orders Ali to strike that off, to, to scratch that off where it says uh, messenger of Allah. And he, Ali refuses because he's like, no way, I'm not going to do that. And so the Prophet himself is asked, where, where does it see? Because he's not a lettered uh, person. And so he, he himself is, uh, removes that. But you see the length the Prophet goes to compromise and to negotiate. And it it gets a little bit more difficult because of the fact that uh, in this treaty that is drafted up, it's a 10-year truce, which is a win-win for both sides, but it comes with some really serious costs that come. The Meccans that flee to Medina for amnesty and for asylum are to be returned to Mecca. The Medinans who flee to Mecca for some reason are allowed to remain in Mecca. So this gives a, a huge problem for Muslim refugees, fugitives who escape and want to get to Medina, they are to be extradited and returned. Uh, but that's not the same for people who are in Medina who want to come back to Mecca. There's no tolerance on both sides for treachery and subterfuge. Each city is allowed to make its own pacts with other neighboring tribes. Muslim pilgrims will not be allowed to perform pilgrimage that year. So even though they all came in their pilgrimage garb, they're all ready to perform the pilgrimage. They're not allowed to enter the sacred precincts and instead are told come back next year. And then the treaty in this sense caused a lot of pain. It was just like, dude, what did we just accept? We just agreed to uh, a complete loss and a complete failure here. And to add salt to the wound, as they are wrapping up this treaty, the son of Suhail is coming from Mecca. He's been held in bondage for the last so many years. He comes running in his, uh, in his fetters, in his shackles, and says, Muslims, please take me. Like, you know, you're all here now. I'm, I've been in prison for so long. Please take me back. Uh, I, I need to be free. And Suhail grabs him uh, and says that we finished our deal before he got here, so he doesn't count. And the Prophet ﷺ, in, the, in front of everybody at this time, tells him that Suhail, or tells him Abu Jandal, who's the son of Suhail, Abu Jandal, be patient. We've made a treaty, we can't break it. Um, but be patient, uh, you know, liberation will come. And 
the companions and especially Omar lose it at this site. Just imagine the sight of someone coming to you crying. They've been oppressed. They're persecuted. They're marginalized. They're whatever you want to describe the worst of the worst. They come to you seeking your protection, seeking amnesty. And because of this treaty, you are not able to do it. And the Prophet ﷺ of all people is the first one to say, sorry, I, you know, we can't do that right now. Um, and the Prophet and Omar maybe expresses what we're all thinking at that time and what so many of the companions are thinking, goes to the Prophet and says, are you not the Prophet? Are we not on the truth and they're on uh, like, you know, the the the, the lie and the, the, the sea? Like, were we not coming to do a pilgrimage? Like, what are all these things? And so he asks all these in a, in a heat of rage because he sees what has just happened. Um, and the Prophet some answers each of these, but he's still knowing what his psychology is as any of us would be. We, we do this with so many people when we are unsatisfied with the answers and we're not happy with what's been given us. We'll go to another person and we'll ask them the exact same questions. He went to Abu Bakr, asked the same questions, gets the same response, and he's just frustrated. And so we see at this time, the Prophet as, uh, as he's wrapping up uh, the preparation, he tells his companions, he comes out, he says, look, uh, we're finished here, complete your sacrifice and shave your head. The rites of the pilgrimage basically are to be complete here. And his companions don't move a muscle. They're, just imagine the shock of having just seen someone dragged from their chains or come running with their chains for freedom and now being dragged back. Um, and also on top of that, you just agreed to a treaty that it seems like a huge loss. So think about all these things that are going through their mind. Um, he tells his companions again, hey, get up, do your sacrifice, shave your head, no response. And he tells them a third time, no response. So. The Prophet ﷺ at this point, just imagine the scene where these people are probably really just shook at like what is just happening. But imagine the Prophet ﷺ as well, just thinking like, oh my God, like I think I lost them. Like, you know, they, they, they're not budging. He goes back to his tent, his wife, Umm Salama. We talked about how Umm Salama was the woman who came to the mosque and said to the Prophet, why doesn't the Quran address us? Why doesn't the Quran talk to us and referring to women? Why is it only addressing men? And the verse coming down that addresses men and women, um, that this is Umm Salama. And Umm Salama advises him that says, hey, Prophet, go out, just lead by example. Don't say a word, sacrifice your animal, get your head shaved, don't say anything else and everything else will follow. And the Prophet ﷺ does that. He goes, he goes out, sacrifices his animal, sits down, calls uh, the, the, the barber at the time, the person who was to shave his head, to shave his head. He shaves his head, everybody comes and finally shaves their head. It's like, it's like the atmosphere just changed, but you see that they're still processing something. They weren't even listening to the Prophet ﷺ, and they know who he is. They've seen all his, his, his miracles. They see his revelation, they see his truth. Even at that time, they are so shook that they are not able, they have a faith shaking experience. And so think about our time now, we're 1400 years separated from the Prophet ﷺ, and this is what happens. This is, this is what happens to so many of us. Uh, and the point of validity, the Prophet ﷺ didn't just say, you're all traitors. Like, what are you doing? Like, I'm the Prophet. Why aren't you obeying me? You should obey me. The Quran says, obey Allah and obey his messenger. Why are y'all disobeying? The Prophet ﷺ understood that this is, this is a delicate situation. And his wife was even more uh, of a counselor in that situation that said that, hey, just go do your sacrifice. What happens will happen. And her, her advice came to fruition. And so we see the wisdom of the women at this time, of his wife, but we also see the Prophet ﷺ not being an egomaniac, not being someone who's like, no, the Quran says that to obey me. Why aren't you doing this? He understands what his companions are feeling because he himself probably felt that pain and having to tell someone one that hey go back to your home um and because or go back uh because we are uh under a treaty so just to wrap things up here inshallah we've gone a little over but i want to just wrap this up after hudaybiyah inshallah khaybar we will discuss next time here but uh what was the treaty of hudaybiyah then was it a clear victory or a clear defeat Abu Bakr later comments that there was no greater victory in Islam other than Hudaybiyah. And Surah Fat uh, comes out and declares that uh, this uh, we, we've given you a great victory uh, that has come about. And it refers to Hudaybiyah. So at the, at the onset, it is seen that this treaty is a no win for us. This treaty is something that is a loss for us. We have nothing to gain for it. We just saw one of our own people get dragged back into prison. Where is the victory there? But we see that after this, because it's just hard to, uh, it's hard to see the forest for the trees with this treaty, but we will see in the time to come how this treaty opened the doors for uh, the Muslim 
uh, cause to start to spread, how the domino started to fall into place, even with something that didn't look like it, what it should be. So it's a lesson for us in our time here that uh, something might not be what it looks like. The, Prophet, uh, the, the Quran tells us that perhaps we love a thing and it's good for us. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, perhaps we love a thing and it's good for us. Perhaps we hate a thing uh, and it's bad for us. Or sorry, perhaps we love a thing and it's bad for us. And perhaps we hate a thing and it's good for us. And so uh, Allah knows and we do not know. So we look at this example. We look at this, uh, this Hudaybiyah, the trauma that was being felt by Abu Jandal, who's, who's, uh, who just escaped from prison and now told to go back by the people who are witnessing the loss that Muslims are facing, by Omar, who is just troubled by what, he's, what he is seeing and his faith is being shaken, yet we see that there is not, they're not being left to despair. By the Prophet ﷺ, feeling rejected by his entire people at that time. The, everybody is losing something here, but there is something stronger being built upon it. And so when this verse comes down, when these uh, verses are being given and uh, how it's being told of that this was actually a victory and you will come to see how how it's a victory, people start to mesh together again. They start to see that there is something clearer, but that doesn't mean that they weren't allowed to express their distaste, that they weren't allowed to express their frustration. This event shows us first and foremost that in times of spiritual doubt, it's absolutely important to have patience, but it's absolutely okay to be frustrated, to have your emotions, to feel, to feel that you're not being heard, to feel invalidated. It's absolutely pertinent to, to lift these up, but uh, it's also clear that uh, to continue in, in patience, to continue in uh, your persistence there. Next time, inshallah, we're going to talk about what happens after Hudaybiyah, uh, because there's some really interesting narratives that occur as uh, the, the landscape now changes with Hudaybiyah uh, taking place and the Meccan and Medinan cities now being at peace. How does this affect the rest of the peninsula? How does this affect the climate at the time? And also, how does the Muslim cause now change? So as I mentioned, inshallah, next time we'll talk about what happens after Hudaybiyah. We'll talk about the Prophet Sallallahu reaching out to uh, other nations and spreading the message of Islam. And we will talk about Khaybar, but also we are going to dive into uh, going beyond Khaybar and now into the, uh, the victory at Mecca. And so the homecoming that is to come when the Muslims return to Mecca uh, and this time are, are to uh, take uh, the, the city in a peaceful way, but are to be returned uh, to a state of victory. So inshallah, we'll cover that. Um, I have to uh, run to another call at this time. Inshallah, if you have any questions or uh, any comments or whatnot, please drop them in the WhatsApp chat. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, engage and talk to you there. Feel free to email there but jazakallah khair for coming i hope you all have a blessed weekend inshallah we'll talk uh again next week at 6 p.m uh same session so assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh have a great weekend you all